I think gone are the days where the only kind of people who thought film cameras were cool were the kind of people who use record players like iPods. It's much less a camera and more an extension of my eye. Shut up. Yeah, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, film cameras are coming back. In, well, in reality, they never really went anywhere. You know, they've slowly been increasing in price since 2005. And ever since that fateful Jimmy Fallon interview, certain cameras have just skyrocketed in value. However, what I find more interesting is the growing interest in photography um, amongst the Gen Z. You have celebrities like Kendall Jenner, um, but there's also Brooklyn Beckham, uh, bloody hell, even David Dobrik, um, whose audience is basically just 12 year olds. He's got an Instagram page dedicated to his um, disposable camera shots, you know, which has nearly 3 million followers. So it's really interesting to see a generation of people who didn't really grow up with film cameras. You know, they were literally born when digital completely took over film. You know, for a lot of people, film is sort of nostalgic. So that's why I find really interesting for these Gen Zs, Gen Zers, um, because they never really, their first memories of photos weren't film. So I find that really interesting. I've been an avid user of YouTube for well over 10 years now, and I haven't seen more growth on this platform than amongst photography channels run by young photographers. Basically, it's a great time for photography. Anyway, if you're a newbie, I thought I'd become your spirit guide into the frustrating, unreliable, but beautiful world of film photography. And of course, it's only natural that today we'll be covering how to buy your first film camera. Let's get into it. Firstly, there are a myriad of places to buy a film camera. However, before you buy one, try asking an older relative. Chances are they've got one in the attic. So because of the internet and because of the fact that literally anyone can find out the price of anything in a matter of seconds, prices tend to be pretty consistent across the board, but it is still worth shopping around because you can still find some really good deals. Sometimes some some might just be desperate to get rid of their camera, so they'll sell it for dirt cheap. My favorite place to buy film cameras is eBay because um, it's convenient. You'll generally find the wide selection of cameras. However, you also need to be a lot more street smart um, to ensure you're getting what you're paying for. So watch this video over here or there, I don't know where it is, um, to find out how to buy a camera on eBay because it's slightly different to buying anywhere else. There are also several online stores that I like to check out. These online stores conduct thorough quality inspections to ensure that they actually work. They tend to cost a bit more, but you also have a bit more peace of mind. You can also try Amazon, garage sales, charity shops. Now, before you pull the trigger and buy your first film camera, there are certain things you need to find out about the condition of the camera. Cosmetics. Is it bashed up? You know, are there scratches? Is it missing any parts? Shutter speed. Are the shutter speeds accurate? Does one second sound like one second? The lens. Has it got fungus? Are the aperture blades clean and free of oil? Does the aperture ring move freely? Has it got dust? Is it film tested? Are there light leaks? Does it need new light seals? Does the film advance work? Does the film jam up? Does the film rewind mechanism work? If it has a light meter, is it working properly? Even if the seller reassures you that the camera is in full, perfect working order, I would still thoroughly inspect and test the camera. Let me show you how I test my film camera. Firstly, I check the cosmetic condition. Are there any sort of marks and dings and dents or scratches that weren't in the product pictures or in the product description? Then I shoot my test roll. I test the light meter against the light meter on my phone. I use this light meter app and honestly, it hasn't let me down yet. I check the light seals. Are they intact or are they crumbly and gross and falling apart? Lastly, the lens. Are there any scratches? Can I see specks of dust in the lens? Are the aperture blades clean? Do the aperture blades move freely when I move the aperture ring? So what would be things that would make me want to return the camera and ask for a refund? A broken light meter and or any other faulty electronic parts. Repairing electronic parts basically costs a fortune in general or they can't be it can't be done at all. A lot of these spare parts don't exist anymore. Um, these camera manufacturers don't produce anymore. You'll find that although demand for film cameras is constantly increasing, the supply of camera repairs is not increasing as fast. If anything, it's, if anything, it's shrinking. So repairs generally of any type 
tend to be a lot more expensive than what you paid for your camera. For example, as I said before in my last video, I broke my first Canon A1 and the guy at the shop told me that I was better off buying a whole new camera body than trying to get it, than trying to get it fixed. And it's for this very reason that I stop looking at electronic cameras and focus on fully mechanical cameras. A faulty film advance, does it jam up my film when I'm trying to, you know, when I'm advancing or rewinding it ever? This again would be an expensive repair. No thank you, you're going back. Scratches, dust or fungus on the lens. Some people don't mind if it's got any of these three things. In some cases, they don't affect the image quality of the lens. And some people just aren't bothered about the resale value. But do bear in mind that if your lens has any of these sort of things, it will significantly diminish the value of the lens. However, if these problems do worsen, then your image quality will most likely be affected. Basically with some lenses, they've used um, some lubricants that over time become sticky and then over time sort of harden up and jam up the, the aperture blades. That's something that you want to avoid. So if you, if you can see oils on the blades of the aperture, on the aperture blades, I would return it. And in case you're wondering what the aperture is, the aperture is that is the diaphragm within the lens that controls the amount of light that goes in. I'll explain what the aperture does in a later video. So if there were any sort of other additional cosmetic marks on the camera that wasn't that weren't mentioned in the product description or weren't visible in the product photos but I was willing to live with that. They weren't that bad. For example, you know, there might be like another tiny mark at the bottom of the camera that weren't, that I didn't see before. I would still keep it, but what I would do then is I would say to the seller, hey, there's a mark on this camera that you didn't mention before. I'd like a partial refund or something like that. Um, otherwise, I would like to return it. And nine times out of 10, um, the seller will give you that partial refund because they don't want to have to deal with the hassle of a return. Now, if the light seals need replacing, it's actually really easy to do yourself and it costs pennies. So old light seals wouldn't be a deal breaker for me. And if you want to see how I replace my light seals, leave a comment down below. So now, if the camera passes this initial stage of inspection, I'd be happy, but it's only after shooting a real roll, a whole roll of fresh film through the camera and getting it developed and scanned and looking at each photo, would I then really know the true con the true working condition of the camera. Sometimes your photos would be blurry because the camera's light meter is off or it's not calibrated properly, or you might find that there are light leaks in the photos. Or sometimes you might find that there are missed frames because the film advance isn't working properly. If it passes my initial inspection and the pictures from the first roll all look as I had intended them to look, then I'd keep the camera. And lastly, keep that test roll. You want to reuse it again should you have to test another camera out. So this is how you get it back. You know, pop the, pop the film release button. It's usually on the bottom. Pop the back open. Don't worry about overexposing this roll. It's not meant to be used. Um, rewind the film using the film rewind lever. And just before the leader, this little thing, gets sucked into the canister, stop. Don't let it get sucked in. Pull up the film crank thingy and take the film canister out and return it to its home. It goes without saying, use a cheap roll of film for your test roll. You don't want to be using something like Porter 400. So hopefully now you'll feel a lot more confident in buying your first film camera. Don't buy a really expensive one as your first one. You know, the last thing you want to be doing is getting something like a Contax T2 and then finding that it breaks and then learn that you can't fix it. Anyway guys, that's the video. If you enjoyed the video, like the video, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already. Why haven't you subscribed? As I said before guys, plenty more videos to come. If you're new to the channel, you're probably confused as to why there's so many fitness videos. Um, that's because this used to be a fitness channel, but now it is a purely film photography and videography kind of channel. Share this with your mom, share this with your dad. I hope you learned something guys. Keep learning, keep shooting, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.